Good morning, Rivercross and others who are joining us today. Welcome to worship. Happy Father's Day to fathers. We're going to celebrate Father's Day in just a second, but I want to welcome everybody to worship today. If you are visiting or checking out some things about Rivercross today, uh, thank you for doing that. I invite you to go to our website and look even more in depth to the things that are priorities and values to Rivercross. What we hold as important is worshiping God, connecting with each other, and serving others beyond ourselves. Uh, the way that we talk about doing that is we talk about stepping in, stepping into a relationship with Christ and stepping into relationships with others. Uh, we have some pages on our website that describe what that looks like and what uh, there are different ways to be involved in that. So I invite you to go to our website and find out more about Rivercross and stepping in. Tomorrow night, I hope to see even more of you for our Zoom Bible study. This will be week three of our Bible study looking at the book of 1 Peter. 7 o'clock, you're welcome to join, and we'd love for anybody and everybody to be there and even invite some friends. We're also continuing to pray. There's so much to continue to pray for. Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock, anybody can call in to that number and we'll be able to pray together for those 30 minutes. We're also continuing to talk about ways that we can uh, regather in some gradual steps and so we'll be communicating that through email and through phone and through other ways but we do look forward according to the best ways and trying to make the wisest choices possible of being able to regather and see each other more often. So uh, here's a happy Father's Day to all the fathers and thank you for those of you who participated in being able to celebrate Father's Day in this way. One word that best describes our dad is supportive. Happy Father's Day! When I think of my dad, I think of the word integrity. Integrity was very important to him and he worked very hard to instill integrity in all five of his children. Happy Father's Day! One word that I would use to describe my dad is funny because he makes me laugh a lot. My dad, Abigail's Pop Pop, taught us many things. But first to be a stoic. We can't control the actions of other people, only how we react to them. Marcus Aurelius said, learn to be indifferent to what makes no difference. Happy Father's Day, and happy 14th birthday, Abby. A word I think of when I think of my dad is faithful. I think of this word because of his faithfulness to Jesus, of his faithfulness to my mom for over 50 years, and his commitment and faithfulness to our family. I think of this word also because he always stays true to everything he commits to. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day! Day. Happy we love, love you. you! The one word that I would use to describe my dad is smart because he is always giving me new ideas and helping me every single day. Ron, you always nurtured us. We may not share blood, but we are yours. We became yours 39 years ago by your choice. I personally was a handful, but you loved mom so much, you were willing to take on her baggage, two daughters, 11 and 13, no matter what. You showed us love and respect, forgiveness throughout, through your actions, not lectures. Though you may not realize what a role model you are for your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you are also for husbands and men in general. Your humor and musical talent is loved by all. We will be forever grateful. Happy Father's Day. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Jacob Sertich, and I wanted to tell you a little something that I learned from my father, Joe. Uh, he was born in 1914, which seems like a long time ago, and it was. I mean, we're talking over a century ago. But what he taught me that it still sticks with me today is the love of nature, um, God's creations. I'm sitting here in my garden right now, and uh, gardens seem like a lot of work, but I'm here to tell you, they can be a place of peace. Uh, what my father taught me was just to slow down, um, not get in a hurry, enjoy the birds singing, enjoy the sun setting, enjoy flowers, enjoy just watching plants grow. Uh, I think we need that in today's world, just that peace upon us and looking at God's creation. So great thing my father 
taught me. So if you'll join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, may you bless our fathers for the many times they've reflected the love, strength, generosity, wisdom, and mercy that you show us. We thank you, Lord, for leading many fathers to put our needs above their own convenience and comfort, to show courage and determination during challenges, and to model for us how to be responsible and caring people who are full of integrity. We admit that not all our fathers have followed your leading. Give them grace to learn from their mistakes. Give us grace to offer them the same forgiveness that you offer us. We ask your blessings on fathers who stood in and now stand in as our fathers when they are absent. Thank you for providing them and teaching them to love with selflessness. Give new and future fathers wisdom to raise children grounded in love for God and other people and to love their families as faithfully as you love us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God promises to be with us and lead us all the time. Here God's promises for us in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam, let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city, it cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I haven't watched Sesame Street in probably 30 years, but there's a segment on Sesame Street that has stuck with me. It's a part of the show that I used to always love. It's the one that grabbed my attention. It's the one about one of these things is not like the other. You remember the song? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the others before I finish my song? And then, after the song, you still have a few more seconds to figure out, well, which item in the quadrant or which of the four in the line just doesn't belong. In these objects that we've been looking through that Jesus and others in the Bible describe us as, there are some that seem to belong very well. Salt and light that we've looked at the last couple of weeks. There are some exciting, some encouraging, and some very helpful ways that those objects describe something about who we are. And those seem to belong. I mean, we're salt. We provide flavor to the world. We provide a, a persevering quality that the world needs. We are the salt of the earth. And Jesus also says, you know, that we are the light of the world. We are like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. We get to shine out for all the world to see so that they may see God's glory. I mean, th these, are, these are images, objects that seem to belong and fit with who we are and what we get to do as part of a relationship with God. But there's one that just doesn't seem to fit and doesn't seem to belong. So what could it be that doesn't seem to belong quite as much, that doesn't seem to fit with this exciting and glamorous and interesting kind of quality that salt and light do? Well, that object is clay. The Bible says over and over again that we are clay. And it's no surprise that the Bible talks about clay all the time. I mean, clay was filling their world. Clay was to them in the Bible like plastic is to us. I mean, we use plastic constantly. We make everything out of plastic. We use plastic. We throw it away. We recycle it. We, we constantly are using and reusing plastic. To them, clay was similar. It was that substance, that object that they made everything out of. Partly it was because they lived in a clay-filled world. Their, their world was, was fairly dry in their landscape. Their soil had lots of clay in it, so they were able to gather lots and lots of clay and make pitchers and saucers and cups and tools and lamps and all kinds of different things out of clay. They used clay constantly. So it's no wonder that the writers of the Bible, when they looked around their world, that they saw clay, and then it's no wonder that they talked about clay 
as much as they do. In fact, if we read through the Bible, we see clay come up constantly in so many different books, through so many different authors, in so many different ages throughout the time that the Bible describes. It describes so often clay. Clay objects and clay as a metaphor. Clay appears all the time. And fascinating about those mentions of clay. So often in the Bible, when clay is mentioned, it is most often used as a comparison to us. The Bible so often describes who we are or compares us as followers of God to clay. We, the Bible says, are clay. So what is it about clay that we need to learn? What is it about us that is so much clay? Well, there are a bunch of places in the Bible where it describes us as clay. Here are a few of them, and I'll warn you, they're not necessarily the most exciting and encouraging verses. So take a look at these verses with me. In the book of Job, it says, If God does not trust his own angels and has charged his messengers with foolishness, how much less will he trust people made of clay? They are made of dust, crushed as easily as a moth. They are alive in the morning, but dead by evening, gone forever without a trace. Later in Job, it says, Your platitudes are as valuable as ashes. Your defense is as fragile as a clay pot. If we jump over to the book of Proverbs, we even see another description of clay. So let's look at Proverbs. Smooth words may hide a wicked heart, just as a pretty glaze covers a clay pot. And then if we jump over to the book of Isaiah, we can highlight another one, and we find this in the book of Isaiah. You will be smashed like a piece of pottery, shattered so completely that there won't be a piece big enough to carry coals from a fireplace or a little water from the well. I told you that clay wasn't very glamorous or interesting. And as the Bible describes it, clay is brittle and dust and gets crushed and gets broken. And clay doesn't seem to be the most encouraging comparison to us. I wish I had known Jeremiah the prophet, the messenger of God from the Old Testament, who so often doesn't just speak God's messages, which is his job, but he also does vivid things and does some crazy stunts to try to capture and live out the messages that he is trying to tell people from God. He, he makes them real, and that's the reason that I love Jeremiah. Here's a section from Jeremiah that really captures what the Bible wants us to know about clay and who we are. And I'll warn you, it's right in line with some of these others. It's not necessarily the most glamorous, but it does teach us some important things. So let's read from Jeremiah. The Lord said to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's shop. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. All right, so here's an easy question for us. When it comes to pottery, who's in charge? The potter making the pottery or the clay? That gets made. Who's in charge? Right, the potter's in charge. The clay has no role in it. The clay has nothing to do with it. The clay's just there. It's the potter who's in charge. Okay, so Jeremiah's image and the rest of the Bible so often talks about us as clay. So if we are clay, let's take the image and let's ask maybe a harder question. When it comes to us and God in a relationship with God, who's in charge? Well, we all know the right answer. I mean, of course, God's in charge. We know the right answer, but what's the real answer? Do we let God be in charge? If we're clay, do we let the potter be in charge? 
I mean, after all, as Jeremiah describes it, if clay lets the potter be in charge, we're going to get smashed, we're going to get crushed, and we're going to get broken on occasion. I don't want to be broken. I don't want to be smashed. I don't want to be crushed. But if the potter's will is that we turn out a certain way, and we choose to go in different directions, and we choose to be something else, then the potter is in charge. And if there's anything that the Bible so often wants us to learn about who we are, it's that we're not in charge. The first career sort of job that I had after college, the first full-time career path job, was with a real estate development company. I got to be part of the graphic design division of this company. It was a really entrepreneurial kind of company, so there were lots of different offshoots and different pieces of the company doing different things in different industries. And we had an in-house graphic design division that serviced the parent company, but also went out and got our own design-related clients as well. After a couple years of working there, the person who was in charge and my boss, uh, she left and I was able to take on her role and I was able to manage this division of the company. And the business grew and we got some more clients and so we hired more and it was a, it was a neat time. There was lots of freedom to have uh, leadership over what we were doing and to be able to have a certain design style and to create our own client base. It was, it was a really neat time. At one point, I had discovered that there might be a better way of being able to service the parent company through our services. And so I proposed a new way of doing our work for the parent company. As I did, the owner of the company responded and he did not share my enthusiasm for this new way. In fact, he said that it didn't think that was the best way to go. Well, I responded with a longer and more in-depth and stronger statement of why I thought this would be a great way for the company to go and this would be a great way to service the company. I, I flexed my muscles quite a bit in my role and maybe I did a little too much because I got a one-line statement back about what I needed to do. And guess what I did? I did exactly what he said. There are some times that we need to learn that we're not in charge. And, you know, it's okay to not always be in charge. When it comes to a relationship with God, it's okay to not be in charge. In fact, we're not qualified to be in charge when it comes to a relationship with God. We're not qualified to handle the things like wisdom and eternity and all-knowing and understanding the way things work and making wise choices. We, we're not qualified to do these sorts of things. The one who is in charge of our relationship with God is. Just like clay is not in charge of its relationship with the potter, we are not in charge of our relationship with God. The good thing is there's also another side to clay, and there's something else that the Bible teaches us when it comes to clay. The Apostle Paul, jumping to the New Testament, the church leader Paul, he talked about clay a lot, partly because he lived in the same clay-filled world, and he knew the way that the Bible had talked about clay. He knew these verses about clay that we just read backwards and forwards. He knew Jeremiah very well. He understood this whole perspective on the potter and clay. And so he, he, he knew he was part of, he lived out clay. In fact, Paul had been crushed a few times. Paul had been smashed a few times and even broken on occasion. So if anybody knew clay, Paul knew clay. So this is some of what Paul wrote when it comes to clay. Read this out loud with me. I invite you to join me. The words are on the screen. For it was God who said, let there be light in the darkness. And God has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay pots to show the preeminent power as God's, not our own. This is like the great contrast, the ultimate contrast that could possibly exist anywhere. The, the contrast that nobody would imagine should happen. 
I mean, it, this passage describes that we are clay and we are clay pots. And that's not a compliment. That is a statement of reality. We are brittle. We are dust. We are prone to be used and broken and crushed and remade. That's how clay works. That's what clay is. But it's within that clay that there's something different. What does this passage say? What does the verse we just read say is within our clay pots, within the things that we are, the brittle and the broken and the smashed and the crushed pots that we are, what's in there? The passage says that within that, we display the preeminent power. That is like the greatest contrast ever. I mean, who would think that within, within dusty and dirty and brittle and broken pots would be the, the most powerful kind of message and reality that could exist anywhere? I mean, if that, sh if that message should be anywhere, if that truth, if that reality should be anywhere, it should be in a golden vessel or, or a crystal container or some sort of a, of a gorgeous, precious metal sort of a, of a container. It shouldn't be within a dirty, old, disposable, brittle clay pot. When taxi cabs were first introduced in New York City, they were imported from France and other places in Europe. And when those cars came over, they were all sorts of different colors. They were blue and they were red and they were other colors. And it didn't so much matter what color they were. But in order for the taxi cabs to be successful, they needed to be visible. And in order to be visible, they couldn't just be all these different colors. And so that's when the yellow taxi cab was born. All of them were painted yellow. And the reason they were painted yellow is not just because somebody liked the color, but it's because it created the greatest contrast with the landscape that was New York City. The greatest contrast is that you and I, in all of our clayness, get to be filled with the preeminent power, the understanding of a relationship with God and the work that Jesus can do in us and through us. God chose in all of his wild logic to be able to display himself and the power of Christ and the work of Christ in us, clay pots. So who are we? Who is it that the Bible describes us as? Well, at the same time as we are clay, as we are brittle, and we, as we are prone to be broken and smashed and crushed and remade, we are also the containers that God uses to fill with God's truth and God's message. If we learn anything, we learn that we are not in charge when it comes to a relationship with God, but we are also filled with the power and the reality of a relationship with God, so that we aren't the ones that are on display, but what is it that's on display through our lives? The preeminent power of God in the world. May we be the kind of clay pots that realize and discover that we are not in charge, but we are filled with the one who is in charge. I hope you'll stay around for another minute as there will be a couple questions on the screen at the end of the service and discuss those think on those so that you might be able to take a next step and we might be able to take some next steps together in our relationships with God. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the power of Christ that can fill us, that can fill each of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what we look like or don't look like, or what we've accomplished or not accomplished, no matter how old or young we are, God, your power fills us. And thank you that you do, so that we get to be part of the things that you're doing. You invite us into that, and we have the awesome privilege of being able to be part of the work and the mission that you are on. Lord, may you fill us with the joy and the understanding of a relationship with you, so that that is what other people see. So we pray together in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you again for joining in worship today. I hope to see many of you tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock for our next Zoom Bible study, or Wednesday morning to hear your voice at 9 o'clock for our group prayer call. It's great to continue being able to do these things, and we will continue to be in touch, and we look forward to being able to hear and see each other soon. So, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.